Old Time Gospel Hour, Program 559, Regular Version. The hammer and the sickle, the flag of the Soviet Union, a flag that symbolizes slavery. I'm speaking on this flag today. We'll have it on the platform here at Thomas Road Church. I'm speaking on another flag, the flag of the United States of America, Old Glory, two flags. On this, the weekend commemorating the 207th anniversary of great America, this free, wonderful nation that I've spent 49 years in. And I hope that all of my friends in the U.S., Canada, Australia, all of the free world looking in right now, I hope you'll celebrate with us as I speak today on those two flags and draw the contrast. I also want to say thank you to my faith partners, founders, 15,000 club members, friends everywhere who during the month of June as we prayed and fasted for a $10 million miracle, you sacrificed. Many of you gave more than once. And I want you to know I take it seriously. I am grateful. This is the first weekend of July, and we, of course, because of advanced videotaping, I don't have a report for you right now. I somehow in my heart believe that when the final tally is in and we'll give it to you as quickly as we have it, God will have provided, but I don't know that for sure. We've just come through a tremendous crisis. Our friends have responded and are still responding. And I'm thankful and I'm grateful to you and to our God who spoke to your hearts. But because of the crisis we've been through, at the close of today's service, I'm going to have a very special, a very important, a very personal announcement to make. Relating to the crisis we've just come through, I'm making a statement, an announcement, maybe shocking to some of you, but I want you to be tuned in and listening carefully just after my sermon on the two flags. From the auditorium of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, the faith partners and friends present Jerry Falwell and the Old Time Gospel Hour, celebrating over 27 years of Christian ministry. Thank you and please be seated. Two hundred and seven years ago, fifty-six courageous men, noble men, men of means, affixed their signatures to the Declaration of Independence and declared by unanimous vote of those who were meeting on that momentous day America is a free and indigenous and independent nation among the family of nations. Thousands have died since that time. Of the 56 who signed the Declaration of Independence pledging mutually to each other their lives and fortunes and sacred honor, most of them indeed gave their lives and their fortunes. None of them gave their honor. And from that day to this, Hundreds of thousands with their blood have paid the supreme sacrifice to make our worship of God in this congregation and, and 400,000 congregations like this one across America made it possible for us to meet without KGB agents in the audience, SS troops at the door, or freedom of reprisal or, or fear of reprisal or retribution because we came here. This is the greatest free nation in the world. Over 600,000 men have died in this century to ensure that right. Over 600,000 died in the last century, and many thousands in the century before. 
the early colonists who came here, great deprivation, sacrificed to guarantee that America would ever be a great republic, one nation under God. And that is what our flag means. That is what it represents. Ladies and gentlemen, Robbie Heiner, the Sounds of Liberty, joined together in pray, playing tribute to the flag of the United States of America, old glory, the red, the white, and the blue. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please stand as we pledge allegiance to our American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. and blue. 
There are two flags in today's world which will impact more upon the future of our children than any other two flags. I doubt there's any debate on that subject. I speak of the flag which we've just honored, the red, white, and blue, old glory, the flag of the United States of America. I speak also of the hammer and the sickle, the Soviet flag that today has enslaved some 40% of the population of this planet. There's no question in my mind that these are the two flags whose systems of government will determine the future of our children and children's children. I want to speak today on the subject, the rebuilding of America. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, is my text. Verses 3 through 7 and verses 32 through 36, that's pages 1447 and 1448 in the Faith Partner Study Bible. I believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ as the blessed and only hope of the church. And in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus was asked this question, beginning with verse 3. And as Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. And now to verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation, this generation, special emphasis here, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise of your second coming, that one day the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who are alive and remain 
shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet you in the air forever to be with you. But between now and then, O oh God, help us to occupy till you come. And our Father, help us not to be fatalist, but cause us to be spiritual and biblical activists, affecting the course of history, reaching a lost world with the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. The red, the white, and the blue. The United States flag represents a number of things. That is why we keep it posted here, 24 hours a day, all the time, every day, because we believe in what that flag represents. Number one, it represents freedom of religion. 400,000 congregations like this one are meeting this week in the United States of America. There is not one KGB agent or CIA agent or federal or local official inside the buildings of these 400,000 uh, religious worship houses to determine what is said or what is not said. Thank God for freedom of religion. That is what the founding fathers came here for. It was a sad day 20 years ago when nine persons on the Supreme Court decided to throw God and religious liberty out of the classrooms and the school buildings of these United States of America. And that is why I thank God for Ronald Reagan and many, many, many members of Congress and millions of Americans are working to again make it possible for little children to have religious liberty in this country. But this flag stands for freedom, for religious freedom. This flag stands for the freedom of the press. If there is any segment of our society who should be standing alongside us as we preach the gospel and cry out for religious freedom, it should be the media, the press. Because if we fail in our efforts to turn this nation around, and that is what this preacher, Jerry Falwell, and thousands like this one are working and praying and preaching to do, that's why we want to see a third great spiritual awakening in this country to turn the nation around and back to those fundamental freedoms. If we lose our freedoms, the press, the media, like in Russia, China, Eastern Europe, ceases to be free as well. There is no free press in the communist world. This red, white, and blue stands for freedom of speech my freedom, your freedom to stand up and say what I believe, what you believe, where I please and where you please, as long as our speech does not infringe upon the liberties of others. Isn't it wonderful to be able to go to the state capital steps of our 50 states as we have done and declare our message clearly and openly and often in contradiction of what the persons seated in those governments believe and no one can do anything about it? I shall never forget the day I took our television crew to Washington, D.C. Uh, we camped outside the Soviet embassy, uh, out on the Washington, D.C. sidewalks, mind you, not inside the gate. And I stood there, and the cameras were going, and I was pointing up to the Soviet flag and said, saying, that flag stands for bondage, for slavery, and so many bad things. Here come the Soviet embassy officials out on the sidewalk gathering around. A crowd is gathering. And I'm preaching against that crowd, that monster called Marxist-Leninism. Pretty soon the Washington, D.C. police show up. One of them walks up and he recognizes him and says, Reverend, what are you doing? I said, I'm exercising my First Amendment rights of free speech and free religion standing on sidewalks I help pay for, saying what I please. He said, go to it. <laughs> go to it. This is the United States of America. And that is exactly the difference between this nation and the Soviet Union and the communist world. The red, white, and blue stands for freedom of assembly, peaceable assembly. We're here today and nobody can do anything about it. We can meet out on the street corners if we wish. You know, people uh, often come here to demonstrate on our sidewalks. We have Nazis and we have communists and we have gay groups who come. And uh, we have atheist societies who come and march. I would never do anything to prohibit that right because the same uh, constitutional right that allows those people to march or, and to speak and to assemble allows me the same privilege. That's the pluralism that that flag stands for. Our flag stands for the freedom of travel. 
Did you know that you can go to Roanoke, to New York, to Los Angeles today without asking anybody's permission? You're saying, so what? Here's so what? You can't do that in Russia. You can't do that in Bulgaria, in Czechoslovakia, Eastern Germany. You get permission to travel from one place to another internally in the communist world. Thank God that flag of ours, the red, white, and blue, stands for freedom of travel. And we can even immigrate outside the nation. We can go anywhere in the world we please. There are some places I don't please to go. But I can go where I please as far as our government is concerned. Because that's what the flag stands for, the freedom of work. Did you know in this country you can work where you please? And if you decide you don't like your job, you can quit and, in, and seek employment in another place, you say, big deal. No, it is a big deal. Because you can't do that in the communist world. You cannot leave your job. You're reading about Lech Walesa these days in Poland under the influence and the might of that hammer and sickle. He has to work in the shipyards. And what, what time he's not working in the shipyards to keep him from speaking out for freedom, they have him in the police station under interrogation and harassment. Thank God for the freedom to work where we please, as we please. The red, white, and blue stands for private property ownership. You know, you live in a home. You may not own it. You and the ba bank may own it together. But thank God one day, if you live long enough and make your payments, it'll be yours. Private property ownership. You say, big deal? Yes, it is. Because if you lived in a communist nation, you own nothing. Where you live, your belongings, your furnishings, and you and your family are all the property of that godless state. What a privilege, the red, white, and blue. Our flag stands for open and free elections. If we don't like our pre president, <coughs> we'll run somebody else for president. If we don't like our senator, we'll run somebody else. If we don't like our congressman, we'll run some others for Congress. Or we'll run ourselves. And the public will decide at election day who is going to represent them. And we can all buy time on the media to present our case. We can buy ads in the newspaper to tell what we believe and what we're against. Open and free elections. In the Soviet Union, there, there are no open and free elections. They have a self-perpetuating group of old men with no respect for life who are there till they kill each other and who re repress and oppress everyone else. And no one has any voice in who represents them. Did they vote on Andropov when Brezhnev died? No. Nor will they vote on the next one. And that's true in the communist world. Thank God our flag stands for open and free elections. Our flag, the red, white, and blue, stands for compassion. Every time an emergency, a crisis, a catastrophe occurs on this planet, who is there first with the most, with food, with clothing, with help, with money? I'm glad to say it's the United States of America. And that's been the case for a long, long time. Who has the most evangelical fundamentalist missionaries out around the world? I'm glad to say the churches of the United States of America. And everywhere I go as I walked among the people in the Cambodian refugee camps where the communists had slain two and a half million helpless, gentle people, I found our U.S. care packages and I found U.S. government packages and all the love from the United States had preceded me there and those people knew it. The red, white, and blue stands for the guarantee of civil liberties for everyone, minorities as well as majorities. Thank God for that. Black, white, red, yellow, no caste system here. Thank God that flag stands for absolute civil liberties. There are no civil liberties, period, in the communist world. And finally, the red, white, and blue stands for protection for the free world everywhere. Do you know why Japan's economy is flourishing? Because they have virtually no military and defense establishment. Why don't they have a military and defense establishment? Because we protect them. We spend our billions of dollars to wrap little Japan up in our protective shield so they can outcompete us in the automobile industry and the electronics in industry, et cetera, et cetera. Little Israel, where would the land of Israel be today if it were not for the United States of America? And I thank God we have been her protector, and may we ever be the protector of Israel. 
and the free world. That's what the U.S. is today. They talk about El Salvador. We've got just a handful of people down there. And we're trying to get some money. The president's trying to get finances to help prevent the fall of El Salvador and then Honduras and Costa Rica and Guatemala and Panama, Mexico. You think we should be involved in El Salvador? Absolutely. I'd rather be El Salvador than El Paso. And we've got to stop them somewhere. And you say, you mean you, you're for sending troops, whatever it takes to stop them, to prevent that creeping cancer from coming on up through Central America and pushing hundreds, if not thousands and millions across the borders, our southern borders, into our lands and creating impossible problems for us. What about the Monroe Doctrine? As far as I'm concerned, I'll just throw this in. That little stooge in, in Cuba, Castro, Fidel Castro, I'm for doing whatever we need to do to him. If our president suggested an invasion of Cuba today, I'd volunteer. And I tell you what is a fact, in my, as far as I'm concerned, we're long overdue. Our flag stands for protection for the free world everywhere, including Central America, Mexico, and these little freezniks marching up, up and down our streets that are causing cheer to come to the hearts of the Kremlin in Russia. They didn't build this country, and as sincere as they may be, they're naive and sincerely wrong. Our flag stands for kindness to the free world. Thousands have died for that flag. Our colonists who came over here 350 years ago, half of them died down in Jamestown the first winter. The Revolutionary War, oh, the sacrifice. It is said that at Valley Forge you could track Washington's men by the trail of blood, their bare, frozen feet. 600,000 died during the war between the states to preserve this union. 116,516 died in World War I. Some of you remember World War I. 405,399 died in World War II. 54,246 died in the Korean War. You can call it a conflict if you wish. I say it was a war. And 57,702 died in the Vietnam War. And all of these died that we might keep that flag of freedom and liberty and hope flying high. And we shouldn't be ashamed to be patriots and we shouldn't be ashamed to stand for our country and speak up for our country when others are trying to put it down. That's the first flag, the red, white, and blue. But there's a second flag that is impacting upon the future of our children and children's children equally if not more so than the red, white, and blue. Mike Evans, Don Norman, I wish you'd come here for a moment. I bought this flag and begrudged every dime of it. <laughs> but I want you to spread out over here, fellas. And I want you to hold the hammer and the sickle. That's right, Don. Come on, I know you don't want to do it. <laughs> the hammer and the sickle. The flag of the Soviet Union. That flag stands for slavery. Slavery. I wish everyone here and in the Western world had read everything Solzhenitsyn has said to us since he was liberated. He is a prophet to the West and he's telling us that the Soviets have one thing in mind, that's world conquest. According to Karavansky, there are five million slaves in Siberian labor camps right now. Five million slaves in the Soviet Union. And then when you go to Poland, when you go to Afghanistan, when you go to all of Eastern Europe, go behind the Iron Curtain, when you go to everywhere their influence has been felt, Cuba and now Nicaragua, the people are slaves of the state. That's what that red flag stands for. It's properly colored, bloody. It's properly colored, anti-human, in favor of slavery. That flag stands for death. The Gulag archipelago system has conservatively uh, 
caused the deaths of more than 50 million of its own Russian people. Can you imagine a system that has murdered 50 million of its own people? And add to that the total worldwide of 142 million persons who have died since 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, for 142 million persons worldwide, and the carnage continues. The Holocaust, the genocide continues. Fidel Castro, south of our border, Cuba, is exporting revolution to Africa, to Central and South America. He is the cause of one of our boys, one of our advisors being murdered, assassinated several days ago, sitting in his automobile in El Salvador. And when I heard the news, my blood boiled, and I thought I'd like to jerk his beard out. Mr. Castro, killer, murderer. That flag, the Soviet flag, stands for repression, pillage, political rape. It's taken away the private farms of millions of Soviet farmers and placed them in huge government farms. And those farmers who dared to rebel were put in Siberian camps, many of them killed. In 1940, the system that flag represents took away the liberties and the freedoms of three Baltic republics, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. And this system represented by this flag has forced psychiatrists and psychologists in the Soviet Union to turn their, their mental hospitals into torture chambers to crush those political dissidents who disagree with Marxist-Leninism. It was this system, this flag, that in 1966 crushed under the wheels of their tanks the Hungarians marched into that helpless and hapless country. In 1968, they did the same thing in Czechoslovakia. They built the Berlin Wall. They put up the Iron Curtain. They have been building a nuclear arsenal the past few years while we've been in a virtual freeze position. They have violated all the treaties. They're moving fast towards a place where nuclear blackmail of the United States and the rest of the free world is a definite and distinct possibility. And the question asked, is the president right in being against an immediate freeze that would lock us into inferiority? Of course the president's right. And God give him the courage and backbone not to fold or give in. And may our Congress have the backbone to stand up. This flag stands for no religious freedom. Don't you let anybody tell you who's been to the Soviet Union that they've seen religious freedom. Now they have a, some churches in Moscow. They have one Baptist church. Window dressing. The pastors are registered, the churches are registered, and KGB agents are doing the tour guiding and are seated in the congregation to be sure nothing is said but that which has met in, it, in advance the agreement of the Soviet government. There are many wonderful, God-fearing Russian people, of course. We have three Russian students here in our student body who, who, who crept out of and escaped from Russia and came here to school. The Russian people, many love God. But I'm talking about religious freedom. There is none in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has no, allows no missionary work, no soul winning. They have no Sunday schools. No one under 18 years of age can attend a worship service or a Bible study. That's the Soviet Union. That's what that flag stands for. And that flag stands for starvation. Did you know that the people of Russia and Eastern Europe are starving today? Their economic system has failed. You won't find any valid, bona fide economist today as you would 20 years ago advocating this Marxist system as a viable economic system. I was at Harvard speaking the other day and someone in the press conference said, oh yes, we have two here at Harvard. I said, I repeat, there are no valid, bona fide economists who believed that, uh, that Marxism is a valid economic system today because they're bankrupt and they're starving people to death to build their war machine and crush the world and own the world. I was trying to think what I'd do with that flag after I preached my sermon. Nobody will buy it back from whence I purchased it. And I certainly don't want to fly it anywhere. I thought maybe I would burn it. But then I thought, no, I'd be equating myself and ident identifying myself with the crumbs and bums who've been flag burners here in our country, and I don't want to even walk on the same side of the road with that bunch. 
Then I thought I would just trample on it. I mean, just have a stomping fit up here in the pulpit. <laughs> and I thought, no, that might encourage somebody to violence out there, so I couldn't do that. I even thought I'd have a seamstress make me a pair of trousers out of it and put the hammer and sickle in the appropriate place. <laughs> but I, uh, I decided against that too because I don't ever like to see one of our flags worn by anybody. Fold it up, fellas. I decided on doing something else. I decided that that flag representing Marxist Leninism, representing slavery and death and pillage and political rape and starvation and the wipe out of all religious and speech freedoms, that flag has only one hope. That flag has only one hope, and I decided I would put it on my pulpit and put my Bible right on top of it and put it under the weight and the authority of the Word of God where it belongs. Amen. I may keep it there. I don't know. I, uh... <laughs> now, I, I do unintentionally spit sometimes when I'm preaching. But I want you to know it's accidental. Our president has been rebuilding our economy, rebuilding the military defenses of this country. When the 1980s began, I predicted that the 1980s would be called a decade of destiny by many because it was my feeling in 1979, 1980 that if we came through this decade and had a moral and spiritual rebirth as a nation, we could indeed deliver to our children a greater America than the one given to us by our parents. But on the other hand, I believed then and I still believe that this is the most crucial time in the history of our nation. America is experiencing a moral and spiritual rebirth right now. I don't have time to read all the Gallup polls to you, but for example, 41% of all American teenagers are now reading the Bible. It was 27% five years ago. America's young people are more conservative on moral and traditional values than their parents, generally speaking. Uh, the Gallup polls indicate that young people today are returning to the moral and traditional values of their grandparents. They are repudiating that terrible social experiment of the, of the 60s and the 70s, moral permissiveness, lawlessness, recklessness that's produced herpes and AIDS and a drug epidemic, et cetera, et cetera, and a 40% divorce rate. They're repudiating that as a bad experiment, throwing secular humanism to the trash pile where it belongs and situational ethics with it and are saying we must come back to basics. Young people are doing that everywhere. I see that happening. There are 110,000 fundamentalist churches in America, just like Thomas Road Church, and new ones starting daily. We're starting several ourselves today across this country. There are 20,000 Christian day schools, elementary and high schools, and four new ones starting every day in this country. And there are 1,600 Christian radio stations, a new one signing on once a week. There are 65 Christian television stations, a new one signing on every, uh, every month in this nation. And on and on the list goes, our campus ministries, our literature ministries, our publishing ministries. Uh, there is a movement of God in our country today that according to Gallup has produced at least one third of the nation professing a new birth experience. And I see America morally and spiritually coming back to basics, coming back to the Judeo-Christian tradition. I also see our president and our government very wisely rebuilding our defenses because when a country begins to strengthen itself morally and spiritually, pretty soon that country also becomes economically and militarily strong. It has resolve. It has character, and that's happening in our country. But Yuri Andropov, who just became the potentate, the leader of the Soviet Union, that flag that I just presented to you, was for years head of the KGB, a system of 700,000 intelligence agents, spies worldwide, nothing like it in history, a brilliant man. He is as brutal and ruthless, in my opinion, as uh, was Stalin, and yet far more intelligent, and far more up on the facts of what is happening. He knows America is having a moral and spiritual rebirth. He knows that. And he knows that if he waits till 1990, as I see it, this country is going to be stronger in every way, morally, spiritually, militarily, economically, than it's ever been. And we will not be pluckable from the tree of world conquest where he has his eyes set. 
It's my prediction that they're talking right now in the Soviet Union about we must move now. If we're going to take America, we must move now. You say they wouldn't dare hit us. A nation that would murder 50 million of its own people has no regard for the dignity of human life, even their own people. And I believe America is in serious danger. We need to pray for America, pray for our president. We need to pray for Andropov. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, according to Solomon. And as the rivers of water, God turns his heart whithersoever he wills. He, Andropov, may be an atheist. But God, our Lord, is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he can make and drop off and others do what he wants against his own will. We need to pray, 1 Timothy 2, for those who are in authority, including our leaders and the leaders of our enemies, that God will intervene. I believe if God gives us a spiritual awakening in this country, if God gives revival, God can and will supernaturally move upon our country and help that every enemy might be confounded. I believe that God is the only hope for America. That's what I'm saying. If we deliver this country into the 1990s into our children, free and strong and no hammer and sickle flying over ahead, overhead, it's going to be because God performed a miracle for us. The president speaks of the window of vulnerability. We are weaker than the Soviets are right now. If they decided to blackmail us today with a phone call, I don't know what the president would do. I think I know him well, well enough to know that he would not capitulate. But that would mean, that would mean a holocaust. I don't believe that's going to happen, but no one can be dogmatic about it. I believe that the Lord Jesus is coming soon. I believe we're going to have a revival, a spiritual harvest, unlike anything the world's ever seen. I think that all of these satellite technological innovations media and communications explosions and it's happening so rapidly you can't keep up God's going to allow us to give the saving gospel of Jesus Christ to every one of the 4.7 billion persons on this planet in our generation I can't be dogmatic Jesus may come today no man knows the day of the hour I read that from the text in Matthew 24 but I believe that this generation the generation you and I are a part of shall not pass will not pass off the scene until all these things be fulfilled I believe I'm a part of the terminal the last generation the first generation, the apostolic church, preached the gospel to every creature. Acts 17, 6, they turned the world upside down. And in Titus, Paul said, the, uh, the grace of God which bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. They, in the apostolic generation, with a world population of 250 million, gave the gospel to everyone. Not everyone got saved, but everyone heard how. That's the only obligation we have is to evangelize, make the gospel available to everyone. I believe in this last generation, again, I'm speaking purely from conjecture, but I agree with Hal Lindsey. I think I'm a part of the last generation. I haven't even bought my cemetery plot. I'm expecting not the undertaker, but the upper taker. I'm expecting to go up with the sound of the trumpet as a born-again believer with millions of others. But between now and the rapture of the church, James 5, I believe there's going to be a latter rain, R-A-I-N. Joel 2, an outpouring of God's Spirit in the last days upon all flesh. I believe we can see hundreds of millions saved in the Soviet Union as well as the U.S. I don't know how, but I know God can. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if God heals our land, if we get through the next three to five years, I see that as the crucial period, the next three to five years, if the Soviets do not move upon us in the next three to five years, we get through this so-called window of vulnerability and come out on the other side strong again, our families together, our churches filled, spiritual revival sweeping the land. If God blesses America, as I'm praying that he will, and I pray that you'll pray he will, 207 years of miracles, let's trust God that on this 207th anniversary of our nation that God would give us a spiritual awakening that would bring this nation back to God and that we might through the churches in our land in an environment of freedom and strength give the saving gospel of Christ to the whole world in our generation and Ezekiel 38 and 39 just before Gog and Magog the communist horde from the north moves in to take everything we go up in the rapture escaping tribulation to be with our Lord for eternity would you like to be a part of a harvest of hundreds of millions of souls, then let's pray for spiritual revival in America. And if we have spiritual revival, here's the verse. And Don, I want you to come, and I want the Sounds of Liberty to join with you for something special in a moment. 
If we have revival, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says this, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. And here it is. And I will heal their land. Do you believe God can heal America in spite of the pornographers or the abortion clinics and the national networks and Hollywood? Yes, God can heal America. And Proverbs 14, 34 in paraphrase, living by God's principles promotes a nation of greatness. We can be great again so that in that greatness and freedom we can give the gospel to the world. Violating those principles, Solomon says, brings a nation to shame. Our prayers should be, God, do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Oh, God, bless America. Let's stand together and join hands as we sing this great prayer all across the building. Everyone, join hands across the aisle. While the storm clouds gather Far across the sea Let us pledge allegiance To our land that's free Let us all be With a light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America. Well, everybody's gone home now. The auditorium is empty except for Don Norman and myself. This entire program that we've just done, the two flags, the rebirth of America, I'm doing it all over again tomorrow in person in Cincinnati at the landmark Baptist Temple outdoors. We're expecting 25,000 people. We hope you'll come. Dr. John Rawlings is the pastor. Service time is 5 p.m. till 7 p.m. Don Norman, Robbie Heiner, the Liberty Baptist College singers, and I 
five to seven will present the rebirth of America in music and in message. It's outdoors, lots of room. Come. If you live in 500 miles of Cincinnati, come and be with us. Located on I-75. I told you as we came on the air, I had a shocking announcement to make. In view of the fact that I do not know whether we made the $10 million goal of last month, that makes this announcement all the more shocking. I've been living by faith for the 31 and a half years that I've been a Christian, trusting God to do the impossible. All my advisors have told me, wait, be cautious, be careful. But I think that as a free people, our time is short. What we do, we must do quickly. I have a commission, you have a commission from the Lord to give the gospel to every person, 4.7 billion souls in this our generation. And since I think that our time as a free people is very short, I don't know how long before the Lord comes or before we lose our freedoms as the Afghans and Poles and Eastern Europeans have already done, we must do what we're going to do quickly. I've decided under God somehow to trust Him to help us, enable us to double this ministry immediately. You heard me right. I want to see us double this ministry immediately. And right now, today, on this first weekend of July, which is the first Sunday of our new fiscal year, July 1 to June 30 is our fiscal year, I'm asking God to help me double this ministry this year immediately. Double it. More souls saved, more television, more radio, more world missions, more printed page ministry, more soul winning, you name it, double everything, including the campus on Liberty Mountain, the campus of Liberty Baptist College and Schools. In order to do that, I've got to raise about $100 million immediately. We want to go from 6,000 students that we're expecting this fall to 12,000 students as quickly as possible. This is a plat, a plat of Liberty Mountain, a part of it, and the present campus that now exists on Liberty Mountain. Everything in blue, for example, this baseball field, this religion building, these four academic buildings, this chapel and multi-purpose center, these 16 dormitories, all of this has already been erected. It's there. It's all happened in the last, oh, five years or so, six years. We've invested over $100 million right now in land acquisitions, developments, improvements, buildings, etc., on Liberty Mountain. By faith, everything in orange is proposed, and we're going to build it immediately so that we can go to 12,000 students as quickly as possible, double by faith in God. This is a 12,000-seat convocation center in the which we can conduct our chapels and other programs, athletic events. This is a 12,000-seat stadium needed much now for athletic events. This is a library. This is the library and academic building we need instantly. That costs $22 million, by the way. This stadium, about 10 million. This convocation center, about 10 or 12 million. And then here is a student life complex, has 1,100 bedrooms, sleeps 4,400 students, with a cafeteria and student union building, and other improvements. All of this, about $100 million, and we need to do it immediately, meaning by faith in God, we're going to double. Now, Don, if you'll help me by removing that one. This is that 12,000 seat convocation center. We need it for chapel, for religious events, for athletic happenings, etc. So badly need it right now. That costs 10 or 12 million dollars, by the way. This is the student life complex. Besides having a cafeteria and a student union building in it, there are 1,100 bedrooms sleeping 4,400 students, more than we have sleeping on campus right now on Liberty Mountain. That's a $45 million building if we built it today at today's market prices. This is a library and an academic building, all joined together, about $22 million worth, and it's so up-to-date, so automated, so computerized that there'll be nothing finer than that in the country, and it'll be on Liberty Mountain for our students whom we're training to be champions of Christ. This is the stadium. Seats 12,000 people. We need that so desperately for outdoor athletics. And this is the new entrance to the campus. There's much, much more that I can't show you, but everything I have shown you, and much more, involves doubling the ministry. And that part of it, the academic part of it, the educational part of it, is a hundred million dollar enlargement. Everybody's telling me you can't do it right now. It's the wrong time. We've just gotten through this one crisis. I know, I know that. Many of you are thinking, hey, slow down, stop. I believe we can change America. I believe we can turn this nation around if we mean business, if we're willing to pray and sacrifice and pay the price. More television, more radio, 
6,000 more students, training, pastors, missionaries, evangelists, school teachers, media people, scientists, professional people, lawyers, doctors. We can train the young champions who can change America and give the gospel to the world. A little over five years ago when we started construction of that first phase on Liberty Mountain, I started a club called the Founders Club who gave me the seed money to begin construction. They gave me a thousand dollars each to help me do it. I'm reactivating that Founders Club right now. I'll be writing a letter to every one of my founders saying, will you give another thousand dollars or more as seed money for this doubling the ministry enterprise? And I'll be writing to many of you, some I've already written, asking you to become a founder, a member of the new Founders Club. This ring, only two people in the world are wearing. That's it right there. It has the date 1971 on it, Liberty Baptist College. Dr. Elmer Towns and I, who founded the school, had this made 12 years ago. Well, we're having founders, co-founders rings made for everybody who joins the new Founders Club. That's the men's ring. This is the ladies' ring in case it's the lady of the house who's, uh, who's becoming a member of the new Founders Club, one per household. But that's 10 karat gold. It is guaranteed for life. Justin's Jewelers producing them for us. And everyone who calls the toll-free number saying, I want to be a member of the New Founders Club, we'll write you immediately. Uh, we'll send you some information that you need regarding a special Founders Convocation to be held here October 7, 8, and 9, during which time I'll personally present to you your co-founders ring. Uh, we'll also send you some information to help you size your finger, so we'll be informed as to what size the ring needs to be. And We'll give you everything you need, a, an official invitation to the Founders Convocation. Only members of the new Founders Club who are helping me in this miracle. I know this is a sacrifice. I know what I'm asking you to do is pass way beyond the call of duty. But we can change America. We can evangelize the world, and we have a short time in which to do it, I believe. Will you join the new Founders Club? Will you call me? If you live in Hawaii, Alaska, Canada, that number won't work. Write me, Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia. If you want to enclose the check for $1,000, make it payable to the Old Time Gospel Hour. By the way, we're also going to send you these three books called The Founder's Collection. Book one is Listen, America. I wrote that in 1979. It caused an uproar. Moral majority started out of that one. And then Finding Inner Peace and Strength, a book on living the victorious Christian life. And then my book I put together on the 25 of the greatest sermons ever preached by men of God now in heaven. These three books for founders only. We'll ship them to you immediately. Call me or write me today. I want to change America. I'm taking a step of faith right out of crisis into victory. Come walk with me. If you agree with Dr. Falwell that the time in which we have to turn this nation around is short, then please call toll-free 1-800-446-5000 and join the Founders Club. We need your help to make Project Liberty a reality. To show you our appreciation, when you join the club, you'll receive Dr. Falwell's two books, Finding Inner Peace and Strength, along with Listen America. Also included is a collection of 25 of the greatest sermons ever preached. You'll also receive this beautiful 10 karat gold co-founders ring engraved with the insignia of Liberty Baptist College. So call today and become a founder. This is Cal Thomas and all of us here pray that God will richly bless you. This has been a presentation of the Liberty Broadcasting System.